Chapter 1 Colonel Blink We MacDonalds are a feisty lot. It's said we descend from Con of the Hundred Battles, an Irish king who slashed and stabbed those who stood in his way about two thousand years ago. Maybe I inherited something from his genes, because my philosophy has always been to stand no nonsense from anybody. I know about Con because one of my great pleasures is reading, and circumstances have meant that over the years I've had plenty of time to study the history of the clan. Of course, mention the name MacDonald, and many people automatically think of the Glencoe Massacre. I am fascinated by accounts of that terrible incident on 13th of February 1692, when, in the early hours of a freezing morning, Nearly 80 MacDonald men, women and children were slaughtered by militia, whom they had earlier wined and dined, generously sharing their meagre supplies. According to one version, the MacDonalds were being punished for thieving. Whatever the motive, it was a dreadful act of betrayal by those the victims had entertained. I suppose that many elements of the Glencoe tragedy have been mirrored in my life, one in which stealing, persecution and betrayal have all played a part. One of the first to die at Glencoe was the MacDonald leader, Alistair MacLean. Nowadays we would term him the local godfather, but it would be a 20th century godfather who would want to influence me. His name was Arthur Thompson and he lived in Proven Mill Road in the east end of Glasgow. I had just reached my teens, when we became near neighbours to the Thompsons. Most people in Glasgow remembered how Arthur's mother-in-law had been killed right outside their home when somebody planted a bomb beneath his car. That was in August 1966, when I was aged five. Years later, I would come to know how Arthur must have felt, but that was for the future. The famous Rotten Row Hospital in Glasgow is closed now. Sadly, many people remember it as the birthplace, in 1938, of the Moors murderer Ian Brady. It was also where I was born, on the 2nd of March 1961. I wasn't the first child for my ma, Margaret, and dad, John. They had had a son, John, on the 1st of June 1959. But tragically, my brother had caught a virus and, despite brain surgery, died at just 14 months. So I appeared on the scene and settled into life in a tenement in Lenzy Street, Springburn, in the north of Glasgow. No bathrooms for the likes of us in those days, and 16 months later, I found myself sharing the communal tin bath with younger brother Gary. This time, Ma like many of her friends, chose to have her baby at home rather than go to hospital, and he came along on the 29th of July, 1962. With the family expanding, we moved to a different flat in Lenzy Street, and not long afterwards, on 12th of May, 1965, Gary and I were joined by another brother, Alan. Among my earliest memories of growing up in Lenzy Street are trips to Woolworths, in busy Springburn Road, when I was around five. I can remember Ma smacking my hand every time we went into the shop, because I would automatically reach into the pick and mix and try to put the sweets into my pocket without anybody noticing. Sometimes Gary and I would sneak out from our house to Woolworths to fill our pockets. Looking back, I suppose that shoplifting sweeties was my first criminal act. It would not be the last. When I was five, I started at Albert Primary School in Springburn. Everybody knew it as the Wee Albert. It was just a five-minute walk from home. My ma's sister, Chrissy, also stayed in Springburn, in Wellfield Street, with Billy, my uncle, who was a steel erector and a fierce Celtic supporter. They had three girls, Anne, Margaret and Brenda, and a son, George, who was the eldest. Chrissy worked in a laundrette. Around the corner from Aunt Chrissy's was a swing park, and not long after starting school, 
I slid down the chute and tore my face. It left a scar that I still have. The flat was overcrowded, and we moved to a four and a block house, upstairs with two bedrooms, and, lo and behold, a bath and inside toilet, and a huge grassy back garden. I couldn't believe this change in luck, and we felt as though we had come into a fortune. It was magical, completely out of the blue, to go from a tenement flat to a big house. We had moved four miles to Drumpellier Street in a district in the east end of Glasgow called Black Hill. I later learned that Black Hill was one of the most deprived areas, not just in Glasgow, but in Europe. But to us, compared to our tenement close in Springburn, this was heaven. Close by was Berliny Prison, a place I would come to regard as a hell on earth, while around the corner lay Proven Mill and the home of the Thompsons where the bomb went off under the godfather's car in August 1966. I'd barely had time to get to know my classmates at the wee Albert before I was waving goodbye to them. Moving house meant starting at a new school, Ridry Primary, where I was soon friends with Brian Graham, James Brockett, Elaine Snedden, Carol Morrison and Jackie Henderson. Ridry was a Protestant school, and I am a Protestant, but Black Hill was mainly a Catholic area. Most of my neighbours in Drumpellier Street were Catholics, which made things awkward as far as Da was concerned. The reason was simple. In Glasgow, there has long been a huge divide between Catholics and Protestants. Sectarianism and bigotry are almost a way of life for a lot of Glaswegians, and nowhere is this shown more dramatically than in football, and the two teams known as the Old Firm. Celtic is the Catholic club, and Rangers the Protestant one. So it was never a good thing to walk around shouting about your love for your team. People have been killed for doing that. Da, though, couldn't have cared less. He was a die-hard Rangers supporter, the kind he would have bled blue if you'd cut him open. He was proud to support his team, and didn't care who knew it. He used to take me to Ibrox when I was five to see the team play, and although I was living among and playing with many Celtic fans, most of whom tried to persuade me to switch allegiances, my loyalties were already ingrained. They lay firmly with Rangers. In September 1970, we three boys had a surprise when we were joined by a sister, whom our parents named Tracy. Since Gary and I were older, we explained to Alan that a big stork had flown by and dropped her in our back garden. Well, why do we need to take her then? Alan complained. The Mondays downstairs only have two boys. Why don't they take her? Alan was jealous when Tracy appeared, because it meant he would no longer be getting special treatment as the baby of the family. But then it became obvious he was not the only jealous one. Da was unhappy with the amount of time and attention Tracy was getting from Ma, and soon we noticed he was drinking a lot more. Then the shouting and anger started. We were nervous and unsure of what to do, and then we began hearing Ma crying and realised he was beating her. It wasn't fair. Raising kids in a place like Black Hill wasn't easy. There were gangs and widespread violence, features of a lifestyle that most people around us accepted as normal, and Ma did her best to make sure we boys didn't get involved in that. She made sacrifices, so we never wanted for much, and tried her best to spoil us rotten whenever she could. She was only trying to be a good mother, a good person. At the time she was working in the canteen at Forest Hall Hospital, which had at one time been the Springburn Poorhouse. Her sister, Chrissy, having left the laundrette, was the cook, and her other sister, Madge, also worked in the kitchen. When she finished her shift, I'd see Ma staggering along the street towards our home, clutching bags filled with goodies from the hospital kitchen. And this was the Ma that that bastard was hitting. It was terrible listening to her cries. One night when I was ten, Alan, Gary and I 
decided we could no longer listen to the violence. We ran into the living room, and, as we were still small, and Da was a good six feet tall, stood on the couch, then jumped onto his back to take his attention away from Ma. He would sometimes come home drunk singing The Sash, a ranger's song. That was a crazy thing to do in Catholic Black Hill, and Ma would send us brothers to drag him in to the safety of the house. There were times when I found him sitting sobbing, his head in his hands, drowning his sorrows in a bottle. The first time this happened, not understanding what was wrong, I asked Ma, has Granny MacDonald died? She told me, Rangers just got beat today, that's all. Nobody's dead, I would tell my brothers. He's miserable because Rangers lost. And they would look at me in astonishment and disbelief that a grown man, and not just any grown man, but our da, was howling and shouting because of football. The boozing and violence became so bad that police were regularly appearing at weekends to arrest Da for domestic abuse. After court on a Monday and a fine, he tried to get back in the house. Ma would tell him he wasn't welcome, pass his belongings out to him in black bin bags, and he'd go off to stay in a hostel with dossers and alcoholics. Money was short, so I started up a newspaper round eventually building up 30 customers and trying to make sure I went for the money just after they'd opened their pay packets. Ma's da, Granda Muir, who was known as Big Jockey, kept the cash for me. I was saving up for a chopper bike. He had a heart of gold, just like Granny Muir, who sometimes took me and my cousin Catherine to Butland's holiday camp in Ayr. Ma's younger brother, my Uncle Charlie, was a Royal Marine who often brought back presents from foreign postings like Singapore and Hong Kong. From time to time, Ma would take Da back after he promised to stay off the booze. But the pattern was always the same. He'd reform for a little while, then the violence would start again. Ma would take us to stay with Granda and Granny Muir, then Da would be making promises to behave. And so it went on. Despite this, we children still enjoyed ourselves. We'd spend hours roaming the streets and playing our favourite game, two-man hunt, in which two of us would be the hunters, having to find the others, who hid out in back courts, gardens and even the local graveyard, Ridry Cemetery, two miles away. Maybe the tricks I learned then about lying low helped me as an adult when I had the law chasing me. Sometimes Gary and I, and pals including Eddie and Billy Monday, George McGuigan, John and Willie Gibson, and Willie Cox, would go collecting bird's eggs down at the canal at Black Hill. The spot later became part of the M8 motorway. These were great fun times. Around then, a gas pipe exploded under a local cafe, the Golfer's Rest, scattering sweets, biscuits and cakes, and as soon as we heard what had happened... We youngsters made a beeline to forage for free goodies. In the summer, I would stay with Aunt Chrissy and make more friends, like Tam McNabb and George Micklejohn. Years later, I bumped into George at Schott's prison. When I was twelve, I started at Smithy Cross Secondary School, which lay in the shadow of Barlini Jail. At times, I'd wonder what it was like to be locked up, but mostly my thoughts were on the opposite sex and football. I'd find myself staring not only at the older girls, but also at the better-looking female teachers. That wasn't my only reason to be cheerful, because in May 1973, Rangers won the Scottish Cup in front of 122,714 fans at Hamden Park, beating a Celtic side that included Kenny Dalgleish, 3-2. Two more of my friends at this time were Joe McCree and James McCulley, known to pals as Codgy. Both were in the Army Cadets, and I'd often see them looking smart in their uniforms. I said I was thinking about joining too, and they talked me into it, with promises of going on holiday with the Cadets. What they omitted to tell me was that these holidays involved assault courses, staying in old Army billets, 
and hiking cross-country through mud in pouring rain. There were about 15 boys from Black Hill and Proven Mill in the cadets, including Arthur Thompson Jr., son of the Godfather. Artie was only a year older than me, but even at that young age, he was fascinated with guns. He was easily one of the quickest at stripping the old rifles we used for weapons training. Guns would come to shape his future. There are many versions of how I came to be named Blink. One is that it resulted from a childhood illness. That's not how it came about. Here's how it did. In the cadets, we used to play football, and one night we were doing that under floodlights. They were incredibly bright, and I looked directly into one, was partially blinded, and spent the rest of the game blinking to try to get my sight back. That night, Joe and Kodji named me Blink, taking the name from a well-known comic book character of the day, Colonel Blink, also tagged the short-sighted Gink, whose exploits appeared in the Beezer. From then on, whenever I arrived for the cadets, they'd announce, Here comes Colonel Blink. Later, some would claim the name had a different, sinister origin. The Thompsons lived on Proven Mill Road, and in 1974 we moved close to them when Ma did a swap and we shifted into a three-bedroom house in Greenrigg Street. At one end of the street was St Paul's Church, and at the opposite end, the Proven Mill Inn, run by Sarah Thompson, whose husband, Billy, was Arthur Senior's brother. Their son, Johnny, also went to Smithycroft School. He later married a friend of mine, Esther, who went on to run the Anvil Pub in Ridry. She's still there, from 1989. In Proven Mill, I came to know the McFadden family. Willie, Wally to his friends, James and their sister Margaret, and became pals with Johnny and Dunkey Martin, and their sister Grace, Peter Wilson, Brian Scott, and Colin and Pat Freel. I also got to know the Denniston brothers, Willie and James, Jim Workman, and brothers Frankie and Charlie Bradley, along with John and Stephen Fay. One of the highlights of the week was the appearance of the Alpine man. He'd turn up in his lorry packed with crates of lemonade and fizzy drinks, and we had great fun deciding what flavour to choose. Seven days later, when he returned, we'd hand back the empty bottles and get a three-penny discount of our next pick. Tragedy hit us in 1975, when Uncle Charlie was killed when a truck fell on him as he was changing a tyre in Malta. He was buried in Ridry Cemetery, just a stone's throw from our new home. He had been based in Plymouth, and his comrades from the Royal Marines carried his coffin. They were smart and dignified, and sounded the last post over him. It was such a sad way for a fine soldier to die. Not far from where we now lived was Hoganfield Loch. We often went there, even if it was just to watch the steamer that took sightseeing parties on a tour round the water. Rab Murray and Joe Johnston did a lot for youths in the area. They ran a couple of successful football teams and let me train with them. I played in a couple of games, but it wasn't good, unlike Davy and Johnny Kroll, who were gifted footballers. Jerry Knotts was another pal who was a good player. Jerry is still one of the good guys, always there to help out others when they need him. While I would never be a star player, I was among Rangers' keenest fans. Da was working in the Cali depot in Springburn Road at the time, and I used to get cheap train tickets, allowing me to travel by myself to Perth, Dundee, Aberdeen, all over the country to see Rangers in action as well as being at all the home games. Some of the great players of that era were John Gregg, Sandy Jardine, Derek Parlane and Derek Johnston. I learned from a young age to hide my scarf when I was leaving the house, because some of the locals and the boys from Black Hill didn't take kindly to seeing its red, white and blue when I was walking down the street. They would usually give chase when they saw me. Being crafty, kept me ahead of the pack, but I could also be sly at home. 
I used to buy sweets with money from my paper round and hide them under my pillow, stuffing myself full with chocolate bars when I thought everyone else was asleep. One night I woke up in agony, but got little sympathy from Ma or my brothers, who thought this was the result of overeating. The pain was still there in the morning, and Gary and Alan accused me of play-acting to miss school. But when a doctor called, he packed me straight off to the Royal Infirmary, where it was found I had appendicitis. That night, my appendix was whipped out. So my chocolate scam ended, but another was on the horizon, and it was going to get me into far more trouble than eating sweets ever could.